1986 was a wild year game-wise, and 1987 is shaping up to be even better. But before we get into that, let's quickly discuss what happened in the world of tech in 1987. IBM introduced its PS2 personal computer as soon to be standard for modern PCs. And they also released VGA standard for graphics. While not widespread yet, it would revolutionize PC gaming in the coming years. CompuServe created GIF standard for images, which many many years later would become a fighting point for all sorts of Gramapolis folk. Adlib released its first sound card for PCs, that was in fact the first standalone one for the platform. And while it was a monumental upgrade over the built-in PC speaker, it still held no candle to the likes of Amiga and its sound capabilities. Some would say that C64's SID chip was as capable. It's not the case, but in the right hands it was a powerful piece of silicon. Microsoft released MS-DOS 3.3 and Windows 2.0. And more interestingly, with help from IBM, OS 2 1.0. A new operating system that was supposed to take over the world. We know today that all it took was good relations between the two tech giants. Square Enix released the first installment of its now called classic Final Fantasy we're playing on NES, but the single most important event of 1987 was the premiere of the first episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, which not only gave us incredible sci-fi opera and Captain Picard, but also visual effects in part made on Amigas. Now, that's one hella long introduction, so not to waste any more of your time, let's jump straight into C64 games for the year. 720 Degrees is a skateboarding game with name coming from a famous trick where one does two full circles after jumping on a skateboard in the air. To win the game you need to win 16 events spread over 4 different skate parks. You start with a certain number of tickets and each allows you entry to one event in one of the skate parks and is expanded upon entry. You can gain additional ones by earning points, which you do by skating the best way anyone has ever skated. Whenever you're not in an event, a bar counts down time until the arrival of Swarm of Bees. Once they arrive, you still have a very little time to get to the park to the next event. If you don't manage to do so, they catch you and the game ends. When competing in the parks, you earn points and money. The latter can be used to upgrade your equipment and to reset the timer. That said, you should try to do as many stunts as you can, even outside of the parks, to earn points for the tickets as they're not an unlimited resource. The events that you'll be participating in are The Ramp, where you perform tricks in a halfpipe Downhill, a long course where you race for speed navigating various slopes and banks Slalom, which kinda explains itself in its obvious naming, and finally Jump, where you jump off a series of ramps attempting to hit a bullseye that's off-screen. 720 degrees is definitely interesting if you're into the sport at least a little. It's not really a game for me though. Abyss is an abstract action puzzler that takes place on platforms floating in the air. The aim of the game is to deliver diamond-shaped thingies into the grey circles with yellow animated rings in them. It is easier said than done, however, as not only there are various environmental obstacles and puzzles to deal with, but also enemies that actively try to push you off the platforms. The obstacles that you'll face are quite varied and can range from barriers and holes through water to mines among others. If you fall off the platform, you lose one of your 10 lives. Why are there 10 of these? Because the game knows that it's difficult. Theoretically it's only 4 levels, but learning all the tropes, figuring out what switches do and where takes time, and Abyss is not an easy fair, so completing it will definitely take a lot of it. Time, that is. Accolade Comics is an action-adventure that's very unusual and really unlike anything at the time. You play as wisecracking secret agent Steve Keen. The game is partly choose-your-own-adventure presented in the pages of a comic book where you read the story, make decisions and often interact with other characters. Intertwined with action elements where you have to take control of Steve directly to overcome an action segment or two. You have two cases to follow through, both equally odd and quirky. First is the disappearance of a famous professor and second the mystery of strange self-replicating non-functioning fire hydrants. If you make the wrong choice in the comic panels or fail in one of the arcade sections, you may lose a life. If that happens, the game rewinds your story a few pages back, forcing you to redo a couple of pages before giving you a chance to approach what killed you again. Despite being very novel, Accolades Comics gameplay loop may not be everyone's cup of tea. I like it though. The graphics are unquestionably of high quality and full of detail in those larger panels. The humor too spills from all pages like a maple syrup spills from your waffles, so if you like comic books, funny games or adventures, this one's definitely not to miss. Ace 2 is a bit controversial. While the first Ace was a single-player air combat simulator heavily based on missions that needed to be completed in it, the second seemed to place all its eggs in a multiplayer basket. And while in theory it could be played alone, I wouldn't recommend it as it's just boring. But if you have someone else to play it against, it's pretty fun as a dogfight simulator where you and a friend get to relieve all those Top Gun moments on your C64. Other than that, it's an average fare, definitely not as good as the first title was. 
Airborne Ranger is divided into several smaller missions of various objectives, ranging from capturing enemy officers, destroying bunkers, to taking out some installations and rescuing captured POWs. The most unique feature of it though is easily its mission randomizer. Each map, objective and location is assigned randomly at the start of the mission, so no two are the same, which obviously adds a lot to the replayability and was not something seen in gaming often back then. Despite the simple graphics, Airborne Ranger was actually quite realistic for the time. At the beginning of each mission, after briefing, you could airdrop ammo in three freely chosen spots on the map, then you parachuted in the area and after completing your main objective, have to get to the pickup point within a time limit. Toasty! Alternate Reality The Dungeon is a follow-up to year prior's The City. Both games, Ariel and this outing, could be summarized as fantasy role-playings, but that would be a disservice to them. They were in fact so ahead of the time in their underlying concepts and their design that the only thing holding them back was the technology that could not fully realize what the creators imagined. Also, probably why the next three planned games in the series never saw the light of the day. The game starts directly after the first one ended and you're still held captive by aliens in an alternate reality of medieval fantasy-like times. You're trying to get through the massive in size and scope dungeon viewed from a first-person perspective and develop your character on the way. Stores, Inn and Smithy are still available for you to access like in previous game, but this time you can also join any of the six guilds that have made it inside the dungeon too. The dungeon is filled with various monsters to the brim and the combat is still turn-based. Alternate reality the dungeon is very challenging initially and requires a little time and patience investment to get better and not feel like a weakling in a hive full of killer bees. Unlike in previous game in the dungeon all items have their weight, so you can't be a limitless carrying mule as much as a warrior anymore. While Dungeon allows for importing of your character from the first game, there's hardly any incentive to do so other than the familiarity with it, as it's not imported as it was when you finished the first title, but in much reduced form. If you enjoy deep role-playing experiences, captivating stories and very well thought out combat system, this is a perfect game for you to just pick up and play. Apollo 18 Mission to the Moon is a fictional Mission to Moon simulator. It's your current Kerbal Space program but more serious and as simulationy as 6502 CPU allows it to be. And yes, I'm aware of the fact that there's no such word as simulationy, but it fits here and I'm not gonna retract it. If you expect action and blood pressure raising moments here, skip to another title in this video, Apollo is another game of speed. It requires both patience and skill, with a touch of precision to succeed. The game was beyond complex to my young self, especially that I'm not a native English speaker, and back then I was a broken English reader at best. That said, if you're an adult, as you are watching this video, and I know it for a fact that you are because I can see in my YouTube studio backend who watches this, the game is within the realm of completion. If you give it your best, approach it few times, you should be able to pull it off. And it's worth it, because even outside of excellent for the time speech synthesis, Apollo 18 feature impressive mixed resolution graphics, with some elements of the screen displayed in clearly higher fidelity than others. It's a technical trickery that hardly any devs used, and it's one that in hands of talented people could really raise overall quality or presentation of any game it is applied to. While you may fail more often than not playing Apollo 18, that one time, when you finally get it right, will be well worth all the trouble. In the very first years of home gaming not many titles could compete with popularity of Pong and then a bit later on Tetris. Two arcade titles most definitely could, Pac-Man and Arkanoid. Arkanoid seemed to be ported to everything under the sun in the late 80s and grand majority of those conversions were very good. C64 outing is no different. It sports all arcade stages, music and sounds are of very high quality and it looks as good as it's possible on Commodore's small system. I'm not a huge fan of controls though, as arcade trackball does not convert well to joystick. I mean, gameplay is fine, but it could have been much better with a mouse. It would make those split-second decisions and near-death saves actually possible. I don't think there's anyone who doesn't know how to play Arkanoid, especially anyone watching this video, but on an odd chance I'm wrong. In short, you've gotta bounce progressively faster moving ball with the paddle that's at the bottom to clear all the blocks from the top of the screen. While doing so, you pick up various power-ups that make the task easier. It's hella fun, if you don't know it, look it up, track it down and play it. That's it. If there ever was an unusual and innovative title, the Armageddon Man is just that. The game takes place in back then far off future of 2032, when the world's 16 major superpowers formed an alliance to prevent a nuclear war catastrophe. You, as a titular Armageddon Man, are in control of satellite systems that are the only means of upholding the world peace. So, you have three SDI satellites that can be used to shoot off any nuclear missiles and you decide when and where they go. You can also spy on radio transmissions between the countries to figure out who the aggressor or potential victim may be, 
so that you'd know how to react. There are also messages and requests that the nations will send to you periodically, and the way you respond to them will influence global stability. Nations differ in technological advancement, military power and resources, so all that along with the information you gather using earlier mentioned means are your clues on what to do to prevent the nuclear Armageddon. I don't think there's been a similar futuristic pre-apocalyptic political simulation released before, and this may very well be the first one. So if you're interested, make sure to give it a spin. Monty is back again, with equally as odd and crazy scheme as before. Since you managed to escape to the rocky Gibraltar in the previous title, Monty on the Run, one would think that you would enjoy your freedom. But that's hardly the case. Intermol Agency, yes, you heard that right, Intermol, so Intermol Agency is on your tail and once more you need to escape. Your best bet, your final idea for freedom, is to trek across Europe collecting cash until you have enough to purchase Greek island of Montos and live there forever and ever in luxury and security. Story aside, our video design Monty is still an action platformer this time however with some screens representing famous European landmarks, like an Eiffel Tower or Leaning Tower of Pisa. The levels are full of ladders and bouncy platforms and are as fun as they've always been. Monty can finally fall off the platform without being hurt, but water is still something to be wary of. There's plenty collectibles in each of the screens, with Euro checks being the most important pickups, as they can be exchanged for money and airplane tickets. While all Monty games are pretty playable, the graphics did not improve much and to me it still looks as if it was converted straight from ZX Spectrum. I realize that it's not the case as there's a lot of colors mixed in small areas and that would cause some serious color clash on Spectrum, but graphics plainness makes me feel otherwise. I just can't help it. Bangkok Nights is a game that always had me baffled as a kid. It released in 1987 and by 1993 1994 I was wondering why C64 never received a Street Fighter 2 port. I mean, the sprites in Bangkok Nights were huge, so clearly this could not be an issue. Now, little did I know that there was a Street Fighter port 2 on Commodore's Micro, but that's story for another video, as it was something else. Anyway, Bangkok Nights is a versus fighting game although it's probably more accurate to call it a Muay Thai simulator. The goal of the game is to defeat all the different in-design opponents in various settings, so that you could gain access to the famous Lupin Stadium and meet the legendary Bangkok Knights there. Now, while in reality Muay Thai is one of the fastest and most brutal fighting styles out there, in a game it doesn't feel anything like it. It's not very fast and limited in the array of moves you can perform. That said, it's fun for a couple of fights, especially if you have someone to play it with, and features beautiful graphics. Nicely detailed backgrounds, the biggest sprites you'll see on C64, and Rob Hubbard's soundtrack. It's a treat. Barbarian is quite fun game when played against a friend, and easily the most brutal and bloody versus fighter of the 80s. While playing you can actually feel the weight of attacks, and head chopping finisher is very enjoyable way of highlighting your unquestionable dominance over a defeated opponent. In single player, however, Barbarian gets old quick. It's essentially a series of virtually identical fights that don't innovate in any way over multiplayer, meaning the only difference is you're fighting against considerably more stupid opponent. All that said, Barbarian is still an important title as it was one of the first few decent versus fighting games on the system. And even though it's not groundbreaking in any way, with no fiery special moves or explosive projectiles like games of the next decade would have in abundance, it's a fun favorite and one worth having a go at with a friend. What can be said about battleships? Well, it's probably the best reimagination of a pen and paper classic on a home system. It can be played either with a friend or against the CPU. Obviously, some changes had to be made to make the game more cinematic, for the lack of a better word, and more involving. So the game field is considerably bigger than your classical 10x10. It's 20 by 20 in fact, and there's 6 ships only, each different in size and having more Tetris-like shapes. But wait, that's not all. Each of your ships, as long as it's still afloat, gets to shoot 4 times per round. So you start with as many as 24 shots in first round. It keeps the game moving at fast pace, while keeping interactivity relatively high too. So, it's good to fire a wide spread all around the game board in the first one or two rounds, hoping to hit something. And then when you do, focus on singular ships. All firing rounds are accompanied by animation sequences, which while being quite neat, get old fast. All in all, Battleships is pretty fun, especially against a friend, which is not something you'd expect coming from this very basic in its design pen and paper classic. Batty is one of the best Arkanoid slash breakout clones out there. The basic principle is the same, you're controlling a paddle at the bottom of the screen, bouncing off the ball to destroy the bricks arranged in various patterns at the top of it. Destroying all bricks allows you to move to the next level, and there's a whopping 64 of these in the game. 
As in most games in the very narrow genre, there's a lot of pickups that can make the challenge easier, and there are double shot, comet passing through bricks, and larger, multi ball, and jump to the next level, to name a few of the available ones. There's also a magnet thingy in the middle of the screen in some levels that activates every few seconds, influencing the direction of the ball's movement. All those features make Trident as that Arcanoid formula fresh, and while in theory it's more of the same, but it doesn't get old and is fun to play even today. Especially that I haven't mentioned its biggest and best feature yet. A feature that sadly will not be shown in this video, as I have no one here with me and couldn't find appropriate video of it on YouTube. But Batty can be played in simultaneous cooperative multiplayer, where each of the players have their own paddle and their own side of the screen to play on. It is honestly one of the most fun multiplayer experiences you can have on C64. An evil warlock Zagrim rules with an iron fist over otherwise peaceful land of Marigold. After centuries of suffering, people need a hero. Someone who will take it upon himself to rid the land of Marigold, its cruel ruler. Since I'm talking to you and you're watching the video, I think it's obvious who the hero will be. You. Yes, I know you've got things planned and you were hoping to do nothing throughout the rest of the day, but have mercy, man. Will you allow people of Marigold to suffer? They need you, and there's no one else. I have an appointment and gotta go, but you, you can do it. Black Magic is a tale of courageous adventurer on a quest to defeat Zagrin, all in a side-scrolling action game with some superficial role-playing elements. As you progress through the land, cleaning it of Zagrim's scam monsters, you'll earn experience points and in time will level up and get promoted. First to wizard, then sorcerer, and eventually necromancer, a class required to defeat the warlock. On your travels you learn new spells and they will be crucial in final encounter with the villain. I'm sorry, what? You're saying that I should have led with you becoming a necromancer? That that would have convinced you straight away? Well, I suppose it's good that you agreed to free those who suffer, right? But on the other hand, it leaves a bit of a bad aftertaste that I had to convince you with a promise of an enormous power you'll obtain along the way. Honestly, I don't know how to feel about you anymore. So I'll just leave it be and move to another game. The biggest issue I have with BMX Kids is that it's only single player. Sure, it's fun and all, but it would have been so much better with a friend. Or friends. I shouldn't really kid myself here, plural is hardly a case these days when it comes to C64 games. At least for myself. Anyway, BMX Kids is a side-scrolling arcade BMX racer, where you're conquering six obstacle courses on your bike in a race against the clock. To proceed to the next track, you have to perform a certain number of stunts and wheelies in given time against five other opponents. Doing so, however, depletes your energy, which you have to refill picking up cans spread all over the tracks. Some stunts will cause you to damage your bike, it can too, however, be fixed by picking up the replacement wheels along the way. The game ends when you fail to qualify to the next race, or when you've no more spare spokes left. BMX Kids was a budget title, but given how fun it could have been in multiplayer, I believe that if the option was added, it could have easily been a full price game. Combat School, aka Bootcamp, is a, believe it or not, despite the title, a multi-event sports game for one or two players. Sure, it's themed as if you were a cadet in a military school, but for all intents and purposes, it doesn't differ much from any other multi-discipline game. The events are Assault Truck, where your marine runs and jumps through obstacles, Firing Range, where 35 targets must be hit within given time limit, then there's an Iron Man, where you swim or canoe over treacherous terrain, after that, there's firing range again, this time you're shooting robotic tanks. And that is followed by the arm wrestling competition. And third and final firing range with a mixture of normal and innocent targets. And last but not least, is a hand-to-hand -hand fight with your instructor, which to be completed needs to be won in a set time. While I actually enjoy combat school for what it is, I would have preferred if there was only one firing range and the other two would be replaced with some other new disciplines. But that's me. Bop and Rumble aka Street Hustle is anything but politically correct. Street Hustle is a side-scrolling beat-em-up where you fight against any manner of unusual for the genre set of characters. From old folks with canes, through gorillas, dogs and beer belly guys to little people. And anything in between. While it may have not been released today, Street Hustle is actually chock full of dark humor. All the enemies are full of character and behave in an odd and often unusual way. Your set of moves is also quite funny, with likes of rubbing someone's ears or kicking them in the balls, being something you'll do often. It's a fun game, no doubt about that, but I question its longevity and appeal to anyone over 10 years old. I mean, it feels at times as it's entirely made out of comic relief moments and characters with no substance underneath. I don't mind it from time to time, but it's not something I would be actively seeking out to play. Speed Buggy originated in the arcades, from which it was quickly translated into any and all means of home gaming hardware. C64 Sport, while a victim of quite drastic graphical downgrade as compared to the original, retained all of its fun and playability. Simply put, it's a race against time for points. 
There's no real opponents to speak of and you have to complete the race while gathering as many of those sweet sweet points as you can. And you do so by grabbing colored flags and if you get all colors you'll get an additional 1000 points. There's also three types of gates to drive through, worth respectively 100, 250 and 500 points. There's also an occasional soccer ball worth 2000 and there are time gates that extend your time by extra 2 seconds upon completion of a leg of a race. The game is composed out of 5 tracks, one being a circuit and the other 4 sprints. They're all pretty varied and fun, featuring bridges, tunnels and are chock full of different obstacles like locks, boulders and fences. All those terrain features reduce your remaining time, so it's not hard to guess that they have to be avoided. Well, unless you're gunning for the lowest possible score, then by all means aim right at them. I was never a huge fan of Buggy Boy, but I completely understand its appeal and why people love it, so can wholeheartedly recommend it, even if it's not really my juice box. California Games is an extreme sports themed title in Epix's series of sports games and a direct follow up to Summer and Winter Games. Same as the real titles, California Games is a collection of few individual sporting events, in this case it's skateboarding, footback, surfing, roller skating, frisbee and BMX. After each attempt you're scored by a group of judges. The biggest appeal of the game however is its multiplayer mode where up to 8 players can compete on a single computer. And I don't have to say, I believe that the more the merrier applies here perfectly. Anyway, California Games gained critical acclaim upon its release which secured the game a later sequel. While California Games released on most systems on the market at the time, this C64 outing was always my favorite. It's hard to tell why, but my best bet is familiarity. After all, C64 was my first system and that's where I played California Games first. If you liked Aerial Trailblazer, then Cosmic Causeway Trailblazer 2 is more of the same, but believe it or not, even more difficult. But that was a part of charm for the first game and it's still for this one. The premise is very simple, you're a checkered red and white ball and you have to get from beginning to the end of each level unscathed and within the time limit. All of the unused time is added up to your score upon level completion. There are 24 levels overall and they're composed of differently colored tiles. Each of them works a bit different, red slows you down, green speeds you up, cyan squares mess with your controls reversing them, blue squares trigger involuntary jump and finally black are the holes that have to be avoided. There are also aliens here and there, but they're more of a nuisance rather than a serious obstacle as they can be shot. Hitting white blobs awards you credits, which then can be spent between the levels for purchasing bonuses and power-ups for the next level. And this can be time slowdown, removal of all black holes, purple squares deactivation and a shield. Trailblazer 2, same as the first title, requires a very specific type of a gamer to be enjoyed. One that doesn't mind being punished and pushed around for a while until they memorize some of those considerably more demanding latter stages. It's not necessarily me, but I don't mind either of the titles in the earlier stages too much. Crossroads is a game that I never played in the 80s, and it's a shame as it looks like something I would have loved. It was not a commercial software however and was largely distributed through a code listing in a computer Mac that the user had to type in, mind you double and triple checking everything, and then save as the machine code and run. I don't have to tell you how often gaming mugs that printed those codes for simple games had errors in them. It was a nightmare. Crossroads however, at least as far as I know, contained no errors. It is basically Wizard of War on steroids. It was faster, more hectic and full of unpredictable and pure fun action. Same as original, it's played from top down view and it features 9 different in design, behavior and gameplay mechanic enemies. Since the maze is much larger than in Wizard of War, at any given moment there can be many more enemies on the screen at once than you've ever seen in the original. They all have been given certain behavior patterns too, and each of them have their own enemies among their kind, so they're not only actively fighting you, but also between themselves. All that combined with monsters exploding from time to time upon death proved to be not only enchanting, but also hella fun to play. And I so wish I would have had the chance to experience it then, as it would have definitely landed comfortably in my daily gaming rotation. Dark Castle is an action platformer in which you play as Prince Duncan who has to get to the evil Black Knight and defeat him, all the while avoiding dangers and solving occasional simple puzzles. The game is composed out of 14 sections, 14 levels overall. In first two sections you have to not only survive but also obtain fireball and shield respectively. They will be helpful on your way to the villain. He is seated in the castle's throne room where you'll face him and will have to topple his throne by pulling several levers. Dark Castle was originally a Macintosh game and was later on ported to other systems, C64 among them. And on that original hardware it was the first game ever to use WSAD and mouse controls and also one of the first games to include an easter egg. In this particular case, if you played the game on or set your max date to 25th of December or Friday the 13th, the Great Hall and Throne Room respectively would have appropriate decorations. 
Deathlord is a top-down role-playing very similar in its technical design to Ultima games, but set in fantasy medieval Japan. The Deathlord and his army are ravaging the lands of Japan and Emperor Nakamoto calls upon adventurers to save the country and defeat the evil Deathlord. You're obviously the one to lead them to victory. Or failure, as the game is considerably more demanding than Ultima games were. There's 8 different races and 16 classes to choose from during party creation, so there's a lot to mix and match here to customize the experience to your liking. There's also 84 spells in the game, and while their names are in Japanese, as you use them you'll quickly realize which is which, as they're in majority of cases a staple spells of the genre. And believe it or not, but Deathlord is another RPG that allows for importing of characters from Bard's Tale, Ultima and Wizardry. So if you were an avid RPG gamer in the 80s and bought most titles in the genre released by EA, chances are you could move your party of heroes between what feels like a dozen of games at least. Deathlord is pretty large, taking place over a dozen of continents filled with countless cities and dungeons. It is easily over a hundred hours worth of adventuring. Defcon 5 is a game I had no chance of understanding when it came out. I was too young and I was more into arcade action-based games as most kids are. When I hit the right age eventually, I was already on the Amiga and back then coming back to C64 felt not only unnecessary, but also pointless. I mean, why would I use an inferior, slower and less sophisticated system? Life, it seems, is not without a hint of irony. And I'd love to have all the older systems now. Anyway, Defcon 5 proudly wrote on 1983's Wargames movie fame, and it done it pretty well, I must add. You're a DoD operative and have to use ballistic missile defense system to protect the United States from an upcoming nuclear attack. But if you think that it sounds like a great ground for an action game, then you're wrong. I mean, you're not technically wrong, it would have been epic, but Defcon 5 is all about details. Most game is played using your keyboard, so you'll be switching between various screens filled with data, gathering information from ground, land and space detection systems in order to detect and destroy incoming ballistic missiles. But most of all, you'll be typing loads upon loads of codes between all the screens. It may not sound very exciting, but once you get into the whole incoming annihilation atmosphere, you'll love it. Delta aka Delta Patrol is horizontally scrolling shoot em up. Terran merchant fleet going through a region of space known only as Delta has gone missing. It is believed that evil aliens operate from within the region. So someone must go there and scout what gives. As in most games we've talked with in the last couple dozen of different gaming history episodes, that someone is once again you. I don't tell you that often, but you're the best. I mean, you are sitting at home now, watching this video, probably having a drink or eating a meal. Enjoy it, by the way. But when you don't, you've got your hands full, saving universes, worlds, planets. Man, I wish I could be you. Anyway, you go alone through 32 increasingly more difficult levels fighting off an alien menace. They usually come in set formations of ships and Delta is one of those titles that require pattern memorization for any chance at success. Destroying particular wave of enemies entirely earns you credits, which are used to add additional equipment increasing ships firepower, shield and speed. Delta's graphics are pretty nice, perhaps not groundbreaking, but definitely some of the best for the year the game released in. Sound on the other hand is decent, but nothing to write home about. All in all, Delta is more than your average shoot em up and if you're a fan of the genre, you'll have a lot of fun here. I really like Demon Stalker's The Raid on Doomfane's title screen. It's beautifully drawn, epic and sets the mood for gameplay. Oh, it's also the title screen for this entire video, just so you know. Anyway, for all intents and purposes, Demon Stalkers, a game with one of the longest titles in 1987, is gauntlet clone for one or two players. Actually, it's a little disservice to the game calling it just a clone, but gameplay-wise, it's basically that. But with a difference that your ultimate goal is to complete 99 levels to get to the 100th, where you'll face a final boss of the game. It may be small change, but makes a difference as it gives you a goal to aim for. Graphically, Demon Stalkers is pretty nice, not the best I've seen, but definitely one of the better within the whole sea of gauntlet-like games. Music is nothing to scoff at either, and while not Rob Hubbard good, it's not too annoying. What's best about Demon Stalkers, though, is the fact that it includes a built-in level editor, that not only allows you to create those, but also build a story around them. So if you're patient and talented, you may very well make an even better game out of it. Oh, and the game's one of the earlier examples of clickbait, or in this particular case, playbait. Because while the aforementioned title screen features a man and a woman, even in multiplayer, you can only play as men. Escape from Paradise is an action platformer. You play as Joe, a man who owns and lives in an incredibly complex labyrinth-like mansion burrowed deep underground. Now it's an amazing life for a Twitch streamer, but not for most others. And Joe woke up one day finding his house invaded by aliens. So he decides to escape. And this is where you jump in, taking control of the matchstick Joe. You have to help him escape with his life intact. 
which in case of Escape from Paradise is easier said than done. The game is really difficult and finding yourself in a loop of death and repeat is not something unusual in it. So unless you enjoy really tough games, I'd suggest perhaps approaching the game from time to time on an emulator where you can save your progress, getting that tiny bit further with each attempt. Express Raider aka Western Express is a port from the arcades and it's a shoot em up beat em up mixture. I know, weird, but works together quite well actually. The game is divided into two sections. First is a beat em up where you fight your way through the train station and then later on on the train using combination of kicks and punches. As you go from the last wagon to the locomotive, you'll fight enemies on the train roof while avoiding projectiles thrown and shot at you. In the second level you're horseback riding alongside the train shooting at the enemies. There's a certain number of these you need to defeat per wagon, but you must be extra careful not to shoot the innocent, some of which will throw bags of money at you, that need to be collected. After completing the game it starts from the beginning just at raised difficulty level. Express Raider is a fun title for a game or two and a treat for fans of western teams and action games alike. Face Off is a hockey game made by the same people who were responsible for the popular series of hardball games. And it's as good as these were. You can play a single exhibition game, entire season or go straight to the playoffs to fight for the Stanley Cup. The game is viewed from the side perspective most of the time, apart from attacks on goals by the opposing team when it switches to the shotgun and allows you to defend the goal. Once in a while, when nasty fault is committed, the players involved may fight it out, and the winner gets to stay on the ice while the loser is sent to a penalty box for a bit. Some very superficial management options are also present in the game, so you can desire your own plays, modify the lines, move players from your minor league team to the major and vice versa, and trade with other teams in the league. It's not something I would have expected from a hockey game on an 8-bit machine, to be honest, so it's a very welcome and nice addition. The game can be played by up to two players on a single system, either cooperatively or in competitive mode, and if there's one thing I could really complain about is the lack of real-life teams and players as Faceoff did not secure the NHL license. It features option to rename both though, so if you'd like to you can recreate the league of your dreams. Fans of the sport will love it, others may not. In Falcon the Renegade Lord you play as a Time Lord hunting down a Renegade Agent of Time. To clarify, Time Agents have to patrol the timelines, making sure that no one interferes with space-time continuum. Said Renegade does just that, causes disruptions by dropping artifacts in different time zones destabilizing the timeline. It can cause large-scale destructions of different time zones and threaten the very existence of mankind. You, our unquestionable hero, have to prevent that by traveling to affected time zones and recovering the misplaced artifacts. You can only carry one at a time, so whenever you pick one, you have to return it to its correct chronological period. If that was all, however, the game would be a cakewalk, so in each of the zones that you visit, inhabitants who know no better will attack you all the freaking time, completely unaware that you're there to save them. You have your jetpack and a laser gun, however, so with use of these, you'll make sure to complete your mission. As you play, you also find power-ups from time to time, bad time travel pun intended, and they can be either a power that will freeze all the natives' movements for a few seconds or an invisibility. Falcon the Renegade Lord is fun, it sports an interesting story for a platformer at least, and pretty good graphics. I like it, whether you will, it's entirely up to you. Despite what it may look like at first glance, Fire Galaxy is not just another Galaga clone. While you still move your ship at the bottom and shoot upwards at the enemies that appear at the top of the screen, they do not just stay there waiting to be killed. Instead, they swoop down you immediately, shooting at you in random patterns. So it's considerably more demanding game than original was. But there's a twist. You don't really have to kill all the enemies, just survive the waves that they come in unscathed. Every few levels there's a bonus stage where enemies do not shoot and just have to be destroyed for points. They move about quite quickly though, so it's pretty difficult to get all of them every single time. You start with 3 lives, get an extra 20,000 points and then every 30,000. And up to 8 players can play Fire Galaxy alternating. It's a fun, even if bit simple game, so will most likely appeal to the fans of the original the most. Fire Trap is a port from the arcades. You're a firefighter. Or not. Who knows? You do, I don't. But in the game you are one. And you have to rescue 16 damsels in distress trapped on top of 16 burning skyscrapers. What a terrible day that must be for the city. I mean, there's 16 skyscrapers burning all at once, and there's only one firefighter who can put them out and save the ladies. Even worse, he has to scale the walls rock climbing style with no straps to securing and no one waiting at the bottom to save him in case he falls. A terrible dark day for the city. And the firefighter indeed. Still, as you climb up, you can put out fires with your water gun, you get to rescue trapped people and animals, and have to avoid all kinds of falling down objects and fire sparks. 
it is not easy. Every now and then you'll find a power-up that either allows you to spray water in all three directions at once, or give you a temporary invincibility, or boost you a few floors up. Fire Trap is fun in short bursts from time to time, but I wouldn't want to invest a whole afternoon just to complete it. Flying Shark aka Sky Shark is a top-down vertically scrolling shoot-em-up and another port from the arcades. It's a decent, solid shooter with a lot to offer to the fans of the genre, but not necessarily to your average Sunday gamers. And why is that? Well, while the game was infamous for being quite demanding in the arcades, it's even more so on Commodore's system. The enemy shots are even faster than in original and so difficult to spot on the bright backgrounds that half of your deaths will be entirely surprising with seemingly no way of telling where the bullet came from. If you give it your full attention though, focus and play through a level or two few times to familiarize yourself with how things are, there is a fun to be had here. The graphics are colorful and varied in terms of both backgrounds and enemy design, and the sounds are pretty spot on too. You start with 4 lives, a single shot and 3 bombs, but as you play you may upgrade your weapon even up to 6 times. All 5 levels of the original are present on the C64, with a noticeable omission of a large enemy plane at the end of the 5th one. Which, while annoying, is not something that should detract you from playing. If you like tough games, give it a go. If you don't, then, well, don't. Force 7 is suspicious, but I'll circle back to it in a moment. You're in control of 7 different crew members, each with their own unique characteristics, and you're sent to an energy production plant on a planet Caris to rescue survivors and dispose of any aliens that are still there holding people captive. You're armed with a flamethrower that you use against the aliens, but must be extremely careful operating it not to harm the innocent. As you go about saving civilians, you also come across ammo recharges, grenades and health. And you gotta keep the last in constant check, as each contact with an alien depletes it a little. And when it's all gone, your character dies and you have to pick another from the initial 7. Now, let's get back to the suspicious, because Force 7 looks and feels a lot like an alien game that failed to secure the license. For one, there's the title screen that does not leave a lot to the imagination, just take a look at it. And then there's seven characters you get to control, the exact number of crew members on Nostromo from the alien. And finally, the alien design and weapon you use against them is taken straight out of the movie. So, I have no idea if I'm right or wrong, but Force 7 feels as if it was supposed to be something else and just lack of licensing rights prevented it from being so. Toasty! Garfield is an arcade adventure featuring everyone's favorite lazy cat and his friends, Nermal his cousin and Odie the dog. Story-wise, Garfield's girlfriend was caught and locked in the city's kennel and Garfield, despite his hate for doing anything other than eating lasagnas and napping, sets out to rescue her. To progress within the game, Garfield needs to find, pick up and either use objects in appropriate places or exchange them with other characters. And he can only carry as much, but thankfully both Odie and Nermal can help him with that. While you go about your mission of love, there's two things to keep an eye on, specifically sleep and hunger meters. They have to be kept replenished at all times, as if either ever drops to zero, the game will end. So, you'll need to do both, eat and rest. As a kid, when I played it, I was amazed by the quality of graphics, but didn't have the slightest clue what to actually do in the game. So I always ended up losing sooner rather than later. Today I do get it all, but is the graphic worth my time to replay it? Honestly, I'm not sure. On one hand, Gauntlet 2 is still the same good old Gauntlet just with 100 more dungeons to explore. And on another, it's still same good old Gauntlet just with 100 more dungeons to explore. And yeah, I realize what I just said and how it sounds. There's still 4 classes to choose from, still more enemies that you could count spawning left and right and going right for you, and still as much chaos as in the first game. There are however some small changes to the gameplay formula like the eat enemy that aims to make contact with a player and when he does all enemies go straight towards that player only. It can be fun in multiplayer but makes no difference in single. The only way of ridding yourself of that curse is either to touch another player or get to the exit. Then there's the special skill pickup that allows for ricocheting shots of walls, there are acid puddles and a large dragon that requires quite a few hits to destroy. Is that enough to warrant a follow up? Perhaps it is, but for me it's still the same game just a tiny bit different. And while Gauntlet is always fun with a friend, I'd never run it to play alone. Oh, and Gauntlet 2 has jerkier scrolling than the first one for some unknown reason, and I think it's worth noting. The Great Jana Sisters Probably the most famous and iconic side-scrolling platformer on C64. Anyone who had the system either had it, or at the very least heard of it. 
It broadened on popularity of incredibly well-known and loved Super Mario Bros and tried to mimic it to the point that the first couple of levels look nearly identical. This obviously lit up alarm lights in the offices of the Big N and they quickly lawyered up and jumped in with the cease and desist. And Jenna had to be pulled off the shelves. Now, did developers have the case and could argue that the game was inspired only and the imitation is the sincerest form of flattery? Perhaps, but could they stand against a giant like Nintendo and hope to survive most likely years-long court case unscathed? I doubt that. So, Jenna ceased to officially exist. Unofficially copies were available everywhere in more or less legal form, and the game became a legend. So the Gianna Sisters is composed out of 32 levels, filled with bodies and platforms to jump on, with some notable differences to Mario. Well, for one, Gianna is not a plumber, and there's no Luigi. There's Maria, but I doubt that she's a plumber either. When they grab a power-up that in Mario makes him grow twice in size, girls change appearance and look like 80s pop stars, with big colorful hairdos and strong makeup. But the power-up itself actually works similarly, allowing both sisters to destroy most blocks. Oh, and there's another difference between the games. There's a quite a few less blocks that can be destroyed in Jana, or a lot more of these that can't. Tomato Tomato. All the enemies are different and many not only in graphics but also in the way they behave, and from third level onward the differences in level design get more and more noticeable to the point that eventually the levels don't seem to have much to do with those in Mario. All of what I just said aside, the Great Janna Sisters is really fun, and a proof of concept that Commodore could have a game similar in design to Mario. Arguably, it had many more as good platformers, but neither was as iconic. Oh, I know there was an unofficial Mario port released a couple of years ago, but it's neither classic nor it runs on basic C64, requiring a considerable investment in upgrades. Gunrunner is a side-scrolling shooter based on the classic game Choplifter. Same as in original, you move horizontally both left and right, looking for survivors to save, pick up and deliver to safety. You pick them up by flying as low as possible, which allows winch to lower and collect them. As you do, I mean both fly and look for them, and then try to get them, you will be attacked by various enemies. They obviously need to be either shot or avoided, but let's be honest here, preferably shot. Whatever you do, however, don't let them shoot or touch you, as it will cost you one life, and you start with three only. Other than the machine gun, you're equipped with three smart bombs, which are your best way of saving your skin when there's seemingly no way to run, clearing the entire screen. And while they can't be picked up per se, you get an additional one after each level completed, so make sure to keep them as a last resort. While Gunrunner is incredibly simple in its gameplay loop, the beautiful graphics with multi-level parallax scrolling and decent sounds make it a pleasure to play. Hat Trick is, I don't know, a third, fourth game in this video that support from the arcades? Never mind. Compared to the previous hockey game we've spoke about today, it seems very spartan in options and game modes available. It is not for no reason, however, because it seems to be directed towards a different kind of a player. While Face Off was aiming more at simulation funds, Hat Trick is about pure action and fun. Each team only has two players, a field one and a goalie, and the game is played for points. There's no advanced rules, no falls, no outsides, just shooting goals and making sure none is scored against you. Each game only lasts 3 minutes, there's no change of sides, and if after 3 minutes there's no clear winner, an overtime of 1 minute is added. If it ends with a draw, the score stays a draw. While all this may make Hattrick hectic and often feeling crazy fast, it's just a lot of fun, even if you don't care about the sport in the slightest. Head Over Heels is an isometric perspective action adventure where you control two distinctive characters at once, each with their own set of skills, head and heels. Head can jump higher than heels, control his movement in the air and fire donuts. Heels can run faster than head, climb staircases that head cannot, and carry objects. Initially they are controlled separately, but in time, as you progress within the game, you get to combine the two into singular creature, having access to all the powers at once. Head Over Heels is composed out of over 300 different rooms and literally hundreds of complex puzzles to solve, so if you're a fan of the genre, and especially if you liked earlier Isometric Batman by the same developer, this one's definitely a game for you. In Hunter's Moon, after being caught by a black hole and spit out in another universe, you're stranded in a universe of self-regenerating organic hives. And to escape, you need to capture the star cells that lie within those hives. It's easier said than done, as they are heavily protected by both mind-boggling puzzles and enemies. Each new star system that you'll visit on your way back home contains different kinds of hives with differently behaving defenses. And there are 16 star systems overall, divided into 128 levels. The backgrounds in Hunter's Moon are rather plain, though you can't really expect much more from literal space, but the sprites for your ship and enemies are of really high quality and nicely animated. And same can be said about the sound. Not that it's nicely animated, but that it is well-fitting and of high quality. 
If there's one thing I don't like about Hunter's Moon though, is that it features a one-hit kill mechanic, which may not be an issue initially, but in those latter levels the game would really benefit from a health bar for your ship rather than have it destroyed with just one shot. Apparently there's a trick where you pause the game just as the death animation plays out, and that revives your ship. I haven't tried it myself though, so don't quote me on that. Hyperblob is an arcade puzzle platformer. I know, I know, sounds stupid, but it kinda is. It's set on a mysterious planet Cubos, where you work as a tourist guide and have to make sure that the group of blobby tourists, represented by bouncing ball heads, get from one side of the level to another. And there's 100 of these levels to beat. The blobs bounce left to right and only ever change direction when they bounce off of something. If they fall into openings, they die, so it's up to you to prevent it. And you do so by building a path for them, it's done by removing blocks in one place and placing them in another. Some of these have special properties, among others there are unmovable blocks, disappearing ones that disintegrate after contact, and mutation blocks that make the blob that touched it eat up all the blocks he touches next. If all that sounds familiar and the name Lemmings comes to mind, then it's good, cause the similarities are uncanny. It's not a ripoff though, as Hyperblob predates Lemmings by 4 years. All in all, it's a very unique arcade puzzler that's a bit too fast for comfort in my humble opinion, but when you get used to it, there's a lot of fun to be had here. Hysteria is a stupid name for the game. Not any game, as I can imagine titles it would fit for, but this one in particular. A psychiatrist simulator would be a good fit for this title, don't you think? Not necessarily a good idea for the game though. Anyway, story-wise, an evil cult is changing the past to affect the future to suit their needs. You're terminatorized into the past to defeat the ancient entity that is the source of power for said cult. The game takes place in three different time zones of ancient Greece, Dark Ages and Space Age and you're running and gunning through all three, defeating literally hundreds upon hundreds of enemies with use of your laser shot. As you go about it, you'll get access to various upgrades, with laser arrows and jetpack being the notable two. At the end of each level slash time zone, you face the entity and after beating all three stages, the game is completed. While it's not overly long, it's a bit more on the difficult side, throwing enemies at you in heaps from all sides requiring you to react and shoot fast. All in all, it's a decent shoot and runner, with a very pleasing presentation and sounds that's definitely worth playing even if you're not really a fan of a genre. International Karate Plus is the final official and ultimate version of the game on C64. Conceptually and gameplay-wise, it's no different than the year prior's International Karate. There are some small yet notable changes though. First, that's also the most obvious one, is the addition of a third fighter. So while the game can still be played by one or two players only, there's always three fighters exchanging friendly punches and kicks. Why are they friendly? Well, there's no blood or fatalities, so it's a sport and not a street brawl. There are some changes in available moves too. Twist kick and somersault are both gone, but instead you get a headbutt, which is always fun, and a roll and split jump kick, allowing you to knock out two opponents at once if they're at the right distance on both sides. It's a very movie-like attack and I like it. Makes me feel like a 20 years younger, 20 kilos lighter Jean-Claude Van Damme. Other than that, there's only one change, the most important one I feel. The dry raising is gone. I mean he's there, popping up to announce the points in between the rounds, but he's not present to observe. His keen eye and praise was always well played and area outing. And this omission is a painful one for me personally. After all, there's no such thing as too many dry raisings in our games. Scoring is same as it was before and graphics and sounds are virtually identical. I guess you don't fix what works, right? There may have been some superficial changes I've not mentioned, but I haven't noticed any. If you love the first game or like fighting games in general, especially those more technical rather than random, you'll love International Karate Plus. Into the Eagle's Nest takes place during World War II and places you in feet of a lone soldier sent to teach a German occupied Eagle's Nest fortress, with a mission to free three captured allied soldiers and to destroy the fortress itself. While there's eight missions in the game, each with a different objective, what I said initially should be your main goal, and ultimately that's what you're supposed to do in the game. If you're looking at the footage and thinking that you'd seen it somewhere, then you're not wrong. It looks and for the most part plays like Gauntlet, so all the enemies just charge at you, like lambs to the slaughter never even considering using a gun, which they actually carry. Madness. World War II may have not been the best setting for the game of the genre, it seems. That said, Into the Eagle's Nest should not be played the same way Gauntlet is. There's quite a few changes to the formula. For one, ammo is limited and you need to collect it to keep it stocked. And 99 bullets is as much as you can carry, so you'll be circling back to where you found it and not picked up before. It is also not worth shooting left and right like crazy as you may accidentally hit explosives and get yourself killed. And finally, you must collect paintings for extra points and keys to get through the locked doors. In short, rather than running into each room guns blazing, slower, more methodical approach is better. That said, if you like Gauntlet, you'll probably like Into the Eagle's Nest too. 
On the first glance, the island of Dr. Distracto is just a side-scrolling shooter, at least if you were to base your assessment on screenshots alone. It's not the case, though. The game is composed out of 21 levels where you need to destroy titular Doctor's fleet of ships, and eventually his hideout, a mysterious tropical island. The screen does not scroll at all and your target, be it a ship or an island, is always at the very bottom of it. You can't really hurt it with a small plane though, as shooting with your gun at a huge ship is like spitting at the wall. It sure will be annoying, but will not destroy it even if you carry on for years. So you gotta shoot down the enemy planes, cause when they go down in flames they hit the target below with considerable force damaging it upon impact. And when they do it plenty enough times, the target will be destroyed. The Island of Dr. Distractor is an interestingly designed game with the first few levels being quite easy and then challenge ramping up rapidly. It's not a bad game though and definitely one worth a playthrough from time to time. Back in the 80s, Jack the Nipper 2 was my favorite platformer. It had it all, beautiful graphics, varied in looks and behavior enemies, many weapons, interestingly designed game world and tricks and secrets. It was enchanting and my young self was often attempting to complete it, never succeeding but never giving up either. Now, today, I know that it's nowhere near the best game in the genre on C64, especially that some of the best games came out long after even the Amiga was abandoned. But Jack the Nipper 2 is still charming and fun to play if you know how, because there are a lot of items that you can pick up along the way and carry up to two at the time, and they should be used in appropriate spots to progress within the game, like dropping a mouse next to an elephant so that he would get scared and jump on the tree opening a passage for you, or throwing a jar of termites on a rope bridge so that they would eat through it, dropping the native guarding it below. There's a lot of little adventure combinations like that and solving the game requires you figuring it all out. So while Jack the Nipper 2 is definitely not the best platformer on C64, it's easily among the better ones and worth checking out. RISK, which stands for Rapid Intercept Seek and Kill, is set on planet Christon 3 that is attacked by aliens, and you're the only one once again who can save it. If I was to count how many times you've saved the universe, I'd run out of fingers and toes. You're the hero, you're the best. Before each mission you can repair the damage or upgrade your ship. It's a novel mechanic and is based on items collected while playing. So upgrades require different combinations of ship parts, blueprints and scientists. And these upgrades can either be faster speed, stronger shot or shields. You get to gather required items and save set scientists when fighting alien menace in a defender-like shooter sections. Risk is quite fun, especially if you're into defender-like games, so if you are, make sure to track it down. While original Kickstart was a fun game, Kickstart 2 the construction set takes it to another level. It's still a side view game for one or two players, where you race on a stunt truck that's filled with water and mud traps, holes, jumps of various sizes, but there are also walls, hills and ski jumps now too. This time though, you have a speedometer so you can control the pace at which you're approaching each of the terrain features and the game comes with a whopping 24 tracks to race on. If that wasn't enough, Kickstart 2 features a built-in really easy to use track editor, extending the life of the game near indefinitely. If you have someone to play it with and there are some drinks involved, then Kickstart 2 with its editor can definitely fill out an evening of retro gaming. If you don't however, then it's a still fun game, just not fun enough to be the only one to play through the night, I think. Crackout is basically another of Arkanoid light games, but with a caveat that it's flipped by 90 degrees. Your paddle is not at the bottom of the screen and bricks on top, but they're on both sides, left and right. The only other difference is that the power-ups don't fall down, but are revealed on the blocks that you hit, and are represented by the letters that correspond to their names, like E for extended paddle, M for missiles, B for bomb, and so on. Hitting blocks with appropriate letter awards you its bonus. The ball is considerably bigger than in original and most other clones too, but other than that, there's hardly any other differences. Crackout comes with 100 levels, but if you own a disc version, there's over 2000 available for download online to extend the life of the game considerably. While I always preferred original Arcanite or Batty for its two-player mode, Crackout is really fun too and the side view actually allows for longer travel between the ball and the furthest bricks, so that the game feels less hectic at times than the other two do. Playing The Last Ninja on my C64 as a kid was probably the most cinematic experience that I ever had on the machine, other than the Sid Meier's Pirates, that is. It was basically what I saw in the action movies, but on the screen of my trusty C64. I mean, who back then wouldn't want to be a ninja? It was the lifestyle every 7-year-old dreamed of, to be a one-man killing machine on a mission for good. You're a ninja Arakuni, and you have to travel through six beautifully crafted isometric levels to reach the palace of the evil Konitoki, who wiped your entire clan and stole sacred document. 
all to defeat him. While isometric view games were nothing new in 1987, none could hold a candle presentation-wise to The Last Ninja. It was on another level and remained a graphical benchmark for the next few years on the system. It was so good in fact that it wouldn't have looked out of place between some early 16-bit games that we had on let's say Atari ST or Amiga. Your ninja can perform few different moves and a block and use various objects he'll find in combat like a katana or nunchakus for instance. Gameplay in The Last Ninja was also top-notch, providing exciting combat encounters and both environmental and adventure game-like puzzling. It was a game unlike many, only to be bettered by its own second outing. Legacy of the Ancients is a fantasy role-playing using the same engine that the earlier Questron did. And unlike in most games of the genre, you don't start off as a hero, but slowly grow into the savior's shoes. You're a shepherd who by a coincidence finds a dead body and a mysterious leather scroll on it. This is where you learn that you must find a way to destroy it, as its existence alone invites a challenge from those who want to possess it and gain its powers. So you'll be seeking ways to eventually destroy the scroll, while in the same time fight for your life and complete quests as in any other RPG. Interestingly enough, while you have your typical stats of dexterity, strength, charm, endurance and intelligence in Legacy of the Ancients, there's no experience points whatsoever and you level up by completing quests. The world map is top-down and features towns, cities, castles and dungeons, and these last actually are presented in the first-person 3D style. Games in various towns and certain museum displays allow you to play in special mini-games that if completed successfully will permanently increase your stats. You'll obviously get to fight, cast magic spells, trade and gamble as expected too. Legacy of the Ancients is a full-fledged adventure RPG and a treat to any and all fans of the genre. Legions of Death is a turn-based strategy for one or two players set during Punic Wars between the Carthage and Roman Republic. The game is mainly focused on naval warfare and each of the scenarios has a set victory condition of either amassing a certain treasury size, holding set number of cities or sinking a number of enemy ships. Upon achieving them, the scenario is completed. Both of the sides have different strengths and weaknesses, so Greeks build their ships for ramming attacks, while Romans developed new boarding tactics, utilizing their strong infantry. What's unique about the Legions of Death is that you not only get to pick the ships for your encounters, but you also get to design their loadouts, picking between the equipment loaded, towers and sail, and kind of crew you'll hire. Slaves, archers or marines. In each turn you can move your ships, attack and conquer coastal cities, collect tax, repair your ship and return the gold to your capital. Same goes for your opponent. It's worth pointing out that when played alone, you can only play as Carthaginians, with Romans being available in multiplayer only. Life Force is a top-down arcade shooter where an unexpected event costs computer systems on a huge orbital station circling the Earth to gain consciousness and decide to let the flexible robot caterpillars serving humans to run rampant and cause chaos and destruction everywhere. Most cities on station were overtaken by them quickly and you're sent in a single heavily armored tank to recapture the capital only to destroy it and rid the station of the source of infestation a moment later. There are 8 flexible robot caterpillars, in short FRC, per each of the 3 levels, and they look like snakes from your old Nokia mobile phone that you had in the 90s. The head is indestructible and contains a fuel rod. You can shoot at the tail though, and when it's entirely destroyed a fuel rod can be picked up from an unmovable head. When all 8 rods are collected, you move to the next level. The FRCs are not your only enemies, as there are aliens spawning left and right, clearly bent on annihilating you as well. You are not powerless, however, and your tank is equipped with a laser, smart bombs, heat-seeking missiles and a shield. I totally forgot about Life Force before working on this video, and now I remember that I used to enjoy it quite a lot back then. It's not a especially great shooter, but for some reason I always found it fun to play. Light Force is one of the better vertically scrolling sci-fi shooter maps on the C64. Story-wise, one of the planets colonized by humans, Regalus, has been invaded by the alien forces. And once more, planet's future and all lives of its inhabitants lie in your capable hands. Thankfully, you're the right, and the only, I must add, person for the job. So you'll fly through four differently themed levels, starting with the asteroid belt, then going through water world and orbital platforms, to finally end up on the ice planet. Light Force features a lot of different enemies to fight against, all moving in different formations and speeds. They're quite varied and keep you on the edge of your seat all the time. Simply put, the game's fun. So gameplay-wise, there's nothing I could really complain about. Rob Hubbard's music is a highlight of the sound design and the graphics are pretty nice too, with animated elements in the background and they add a lot to the scenes, no doubt about that. And if there's one thing I could and will really pick on, it's the scrolling. It could be a touch smoother. I'm not saying that it's bad, it just could be much better. Overall, it's a great game and all fans of shooters will love it. Livingstone, I presume, is an action platformer where you play as the explorer Henry Morton Stanley, looking for the missing David Livingstone in Africa. The title corresponds to the famous phrase real-life Henry Stanley asked when he found David Livingstone. 
Funny enough, in the game at the very end of it, the character replies no, sorta confirming that there was going to be a sequel released for it. As you search for the missing adventure, you visit many different themed locations, jungles, a village, a mine, waterfalls, dungeons and a temple. Some of these have secret passages between them, so exploration is definitely rewarded. Your character can walk, crouch and jump, and has four items at his disposal, boomerang, dagger, grenade and a pole. Each of those can be used with a different force based on the length the fire button is pressed, and they can be utilized as weapons or as tools for puzzling, for instance boomerang can be thrown to press far off switches. The game is filled with various enemies and dangers obviously, cause if it wasn't, Livingstone could have just found his own way back. So you'll face pygmies with blowpipes, crocodiles, snakes, monkeys throwing coconuts, quicksand, cannibals and carnivorous plants to name a few. A jungle worth of death. And if that wasn't enough, you also need to eat and drink not to die. And find 5 gemstones that are required to enter the temple beyond which Livingstone is trapped. Well, it's not really Livingstone, is it? We've mentioned it already. Anyway, it's a difficult but fun and rewarding game, definitely worth the time investment. Mean Streak seems like a mix between Mad Max and Road Rush as it takes place in a bleak and dystopian future. It's a racer slash shooter where you fight off opponents traveling long abandoned M25 motorway known as the Battle Track. It's a constant straight with no turns or corners, filled with potholes, oil and water slicks and even oddly placed walls. To fight off onslaught of enemies, you're armed with unlimited forward shooting machine guns, limited rockets and a few uses of oil that you can spill behind you. Enemies are similarly armed, short of rockets and they attack you constantly all throughout the game. Interestingly enough, C64 version of the game allows for simultaneous two-person multiplayer, where there's no CPU opponents and it's just a battle between the two racers. Who can eliminate the other one first? Despite its simplicity, Mean Streak is quite fun, even if a bit repeatable. Mega Apocalypse is one of the better pick up and play shooters on C64. You don't need to immerse yourself in the story, learn about your motivation or what you're fighting against. You just fire it up and keep shooting. And you're shooting, well, planets and moons moving about in a rapid, seemingly random fashion. Let me start from beginning, cause otherwise it would make no sense. You're sorta of flying forwards, inwards towards the center of the screen, with background stars passing by, adding to the feeling of speed. You can rotate your ship in 360 degrees and move all over the screen, destroying anything and everything you come across. Don't think about it, just shoot whenever you see something. And I gotta say it's refreshing just to shoot things for the heck of it and not to save someone or something. No higher purpose here. I mean, even heroes need a day off once in a while, right? Mega Apocalypse features a simultaneous two-player mode which makes it even more playable and if you add to it 5 channel sound and music by legendary Rob Hubbard, the game would have been a system seller if it released a couple of years earlier. I realize that the footage may give away chaotic vibes, but trust me, if you like shooters at all, you can hardly go any better on C64. Metro Cross is a port from the arcades that, while suffering from an obvious technological downgrade to 8-bit, remained very playable. It's a fast-paced jump-and-run action game that does not overwhelm the player with controls or underlying mechanics. Your goal is simple, there's few stages in the game and you run through them. You don't shoot, don't push anything, don't even have to keep running, your little character does it all by himself. Well, running, the rest is not present in the game. And your only responsibility is to make sure that he reaches the end of each stage by avoiding various obstacles, period. Metro Cross is very easy to pick up and play and devilishly difficult to master. Cause while the gameplay is straightforward, the time you have to complete each stage is so unforgiving that you'll require Jedi-like reflexes to even have a chance at completing all of them. All that said, it's a title that feels hella rewarding when you eventually overcome that certain stage you've been struggling with for a while and the achievements do not always need to be telegraphed on the screen with a sound jingle and a flashy pop-up. Graphics and sounds are not great, but don't let them detract you from playing. Metro Cross is definitely a game worth your time and a permanent spot in your retro gaming rotation. Miniboot is bar none the best mini golf game on C64, and one of the better ones overall, even to this day. It's easy to pick up and learn, so that it can be enjoyed by practically anyone, even without any knowledge of the sport, but in the same time it's difficult to master, especially those latter more demanding holes in power. If you add to it pretty nice easily readable graphics and multiplayer with up to 4 of you competing on the same system and 4 sets of unique courses, it makes for an incredibly enjoyable gameplay. Each course is entirely different in terms of both layout and difficulty level and requires a bit different approach. If you like mini golf or even just to play with others, there's hardly any better game to get yourself lost in on Commodore's 8-bit micro. Motus is a versus action game that originated in the arcades. It's basically a battle royale played with bumper cars on rectangle playfield built out of tiles. The goal is to bump off the opponents of the game board while in the same time defending yourself from being bumped too. 
The game can be played by two players and it's most fun that way. But even if you're alone, it's actually pretty good too and can get hectic at times. When you manage to get rid of all opponents and bump them off the board, you move to the next round. If the match is taking too long, a fireball will slowly start removing tiles, making for a more demanding competition. In some rounds you can collect power-ups that will allow you to have stronger bumping powers and more importantly, ability to jump over gaps. After landing few times on a tile from a jump like that, it collapses creating another cavity in the game field. Motos is fun and if you have someone with you who also likes C64 games, it can prove one of the better titles to play together. Now, this is not going to be a game preview but a history lesson as I've just learned a terrible truth. Mass media has been telling us for years that Canadians are nothing more than incredibly nice, conflict avoiding, maple syrup drinking folk. Mass media was lying. Luckily, creators of Mounty Mix Death Right did not fall for the propaganda and decided to spill the truth. And I'm here to share it all with you, so that the lies about seemingly peaceful maple syrup land can be brought to light. They are all unsung heroes that most of us don't even know of. All Canadian Mounties, and by extension of that, most Canadians, as everyone knows that most Canadians are born Mounties, run on top of trains. 8 hours per day, 7 days a week, constantly, in shifts. It's basically your Pacific Rim scenario but in Canada. Why do they do that? Well, to stop the nefarious bandits invading their beautiful country by the only logical means. Roofs of the trains. Because any real criminal knows that there's no better way to smuggle yourself somewhere than that. So, our poor, poor heroes every single day dress in red, put on their funky hats and get to the closest train station to defend the land. And it's not easy, as those pesky buddies usually bring weapons with them and don't hesitate to shoot at our peaceful lads. Now, they can if they want to shoot back, but if they choose to spare lives, being the good guys that they are, they resort to jumping on the enemies, dropping them off the train, and hence saving them from death, only leaving them mangled for the rest of their lives. Did I mention grenades? Well, there's obviously grenades too, because evil knows no bounds and our Canadian brothers and sisters have to face that too. I gotta tell you guys, I didn't expect to learn so much today about one nation's culture and struggle, their constant fight against onslaught of bandits invading their motherland. So, for all they have to go through on a daily basis, Mounties, I salute you. Mousetrap is an arcade single screen platformer and a game that's conceptually similar to Manic Miner. You play as a mouse, surprise surprise, and have to collect random objects. They can be anything from cheese through cakes to balloons and anything in between. Frankly, what they are is irrelevant. What's important is that all of them need to be picked up in each level for the door to the next to open. And all that with a limited time. So, you'll be jumping over flowers among others, avoid bouncing balls and various different enemies, as contact with any will cost you a life. The levels are composed out of typical for the genre platforms, ladders and ledges, and shortfalls are fine, but if you drop from great height, it'll cost you a life. Mousetrap is perhaps not the best platformer on C64, but it's fun, for an hour or so, every once in a while. Mutants is a top-down arcade shooter where you travel through 15 levels fighting off enemies and collecting 15 parts of a self-destruct system. Just assemble them at the end and destroy the Survivor Zero Corporation. The antagonist of the game, a huge conglomerate that supplies weapons to all sides of all conflicts without any scruples. Their latest creation, a microgenetic mutoid, so micromutants, are extremely dangerous microorganisms that are very aggressive and able to mutate upon need to face any and all opposition. They are in fact most likely going to devour all life in the galaxy if left to their own devices. So you, a rainbow warrior, I know it's a name you've heard before, are sent to find all those self-destruct mechanism pieces and to stop the evil company. Sound design and graphics are pretty good, even if not great, but number of sprites on the screen in certain levels can be pretty impressive, I must add. If you like shooters, and especially if you like Hunter's Moon mentioned in one of the earlier episodes, you like mutants as they share a lot in their design. Nebulus is an unusual action platformer, but we'll get back to it in a second. And second. Well, that was fast, so it's unusual because of how it displays its graphics. A character is in the middle of the screen, and when he moves, his sprite stays stationary in the middle, with the background rotating around it. And given the fact that the levels are the towers he walks around outside of, on the ledges, it gives the game a very pseudo 3D effect. It is probably one of the more WOW games on C64. So games that make you go WOW coming from other 8-bit platforms. Sure, Nebulous had ports to other 8-bit machines too, but I feel that it shined the most on Commodore's Little Beast. Story-wise, because of course there's a story, you're a green bipedal armless dude who has to get to top of 8 towers to blow them up and by doing so prevent poisoning of water supplies on planets that they're on. I know, sounds stupid, but whatever, it's a platformer. It plays and looks great, so who cares? In between the towers, the game switches into the side-scrolling bonus stages where you can collect bonus points. Nebulous is one of the better-known C64 games, and not for no reason. 
and every C64 owner, regardless if they like platformers or not, should check it out to experience the aforementioned wow effect, cause it's even better in real life than it is on the video. Nemesis The Warlock is a single screen action platformer based on a British comic book by the same name. If you've not read the comics, the characters and the story may seem odd, so I'll give you the gist of it. You're Nemesis, and you're the anti-hero of the game, but you're not bad per se. Torque Maida is the Grandmaster of Termite, he commands the hordes of Terminators and rules the earth with his tyrant Iron Fist. He's definitely the bad one. And the game will take you through 30 single screen levels filled with villains armies that you'll need to dispose of to eventually defeat the Torque Maida himself. You're armed with a sword and a gun with a limited ammo and while it may not sound like a lot, I know you. I've seen you conquer bigger evils and save universes. You'll manage. I believe in you. Interestingly enough, bodies of defeated opponents remain on the screen and some levels may require you to pile them up to be able to reach higher platforms, using them as stepping stones. A bit gruesome, but otherwise interesting mechanic. I'm not a big fan of graphics in Nemesis, I don't know why, but it feels blank and blocky in the same time, to me. But gameplay is pretty fun, so overall it's a recommendation. In Octopolis, you're the bad guy. For once I must add, cause that Mr. Goodishoes behavior of yours was starting to get old. I mean, I'm glad that you saved so many so often, but it was beginning to look suspicious. No one is that good. And now you've proved I'm right. You play as a pilot working for the Empire, helping it conquer the last planet that was not under the rule yet. And to do so, you need to capture 8 biggest cities and deactivate planet's defenses. Octopolis is part horizontally scrolling shooter and part action platformer. In fact, every level in the game is divided in these two sections. In shooter part of the game, your ship is viewed from both side and top down, as you do not only move up and down, but also sideways. The side movement is done by holding down the fire button. How do you shoot, you may wonder? Well, the ship shoots automatically, so that's one thing that you don't need to worry about. That said, I hope it's some kind of energy projectile, as otherwise bullet number you go through will quickly send you to the cleaners. I mean, who can afford so many shots? When a certain number of enemies is destroyed, you have to maneuver your ship onto a special spot that will allow you to enter the city you fought over and start playing in the platforming section of the game, which is always divided into five screen-sized rooms in which you shoot the evil eyes for points and avoid enemies on which your weapon is ineffective. Octopolis is fun, go play it. PHM Pegasus is a combat simulation game in which you control small maneuverable attack boat, completing a variety of different missions. They can be anything from destroying enemy vessels through surveillance to escorting and supply ships through enemy territory. You obviously start the game at the lowest rank and as you progress through it, completing missions successfully, you'll get promoted, eventually becoming Admiral. Missions can be attempted at any order and don't follow any overarching plot. You will get to control additional units like other ships and helicopters in some of them and that's always fun, so there's a lot of variety if you're into the genre. Honestly, I only ever really cared about submarines when it came to naval simulations, so you'll have to try Pegasus out and make up your own mind about it. Platoon is based on a cult classic movie of the same title. It loosely follows the plot of it too, and it's an action adventure where you take a squad of five soldiers through scenes taken out straight from the movie. First is side-scrolling, where you run through a jungle and can jump and duck to avoid various dangers. You will also engage enemy soldiers here, but your goal is to blow up a bridge and then locate village and find torch, map and a trapdoor. Next section is entirely different, as it's viewed from the first-person perspective, where you move through a series of tunnels looking for flares and a compass. You will be attacked by bodies here too, but more in an Operation Warflag style. After escaping tunnels, you fortify yourself in a bunker for the night, using flares to locate the enemies to shoot at. When that's done, you have two minutes to rush into a safe position north using early found compass for directions. And finally, you face against the antagonist of the game, Sergeant Bards. I must hit him with grenades five times to win the game. Platoon may not be the best action game on C64, but it's very varied and because of that, really fun. Point X is a vertically scrolling shooter that in its gameplay design is clearly inspired by Zivius. That said, some would argue that it's better than Commodore's port of original. The jury is still out on that, but it's pretty fun and genuinely good looking shooter nonetheless. So, you'll be fighting various unique enemies that fly in different patterns and bombing their land installations too. Some of these should bug though, so keep that in mind. Graphically, Point X is quite nice and sounds are up to par too, so if you enjoy shoot em ups, it's definitely one worth tracking down and trying out. What I don't like about it though, is the difficulty curve, which is just horrendous. And the fact that upgrades are far in between and also reset at the start of each new level is just another drop. While first level may be a tad on a demanding side, the second is like a brick wall that you keep hitting with your head hoping to make a dent in. The jumping difficulty is so steep in fact that only seasoned shoot em up veterans will be able to contain the beast of this game and complete it. If you're one of them, there's hardly any better. If you're not, then probably better skip it as frustration it can create is only comparable to that caused by modern Souls-like games. Power Struggle is pitting East against West in this global military strategy that's played both in turns and in real time. I know, sounds stupid, but hear me out. 
UNF rent or UNCPU play opposing sides of the conflict, fighting for control over neutral countries to take them over and assimilate into your empire. While you fight for them, you can also attempt to take those over belonging to the opponent, so the game is as much about attack as it is about defense. Not all actions require use of military, and some countries may be taken over peacefully by a political influence or other means. While you make choices on what to do in turns, which are time limited but turns nonetheless, when you issue them and then your opponent does the same, all are executed together in real time. And that's what I meant saying that it's played in both, cause if you think about it, it is. Anyway, the game is fine when played against a friend, and not so much alone. Not saying that it's bad, just that it loses a lot of its appeal. Some would say that Project Stealth Fighter is the very best flight combat simulation on C64. Now, I am not a simulation nut, just a regular one, nut that is, so all I can tell you is that it indeed is a very good game. Is it the best? It's hard for me to judge, but it's definitely out there with the top of the top for the genre. In fact, it was awarded the original award for the best military or strategy computer game of 1987. Don't know how much that means to you, but apparently at the time it was notable. The game places you in the cockpit of a Lockheed F-19 and lets you fly numerous different missions in Libya, Persian Gulf, Scandinavia and Central Europe. All these have selectable setup parameters such as rules of engagement, escalation of conflict, risk, type of targets and skill level of fighting and landing. That degree of control made the game practically infinitely playable as each mission could be set up entirely different than any other. If you like simulations, don't sleep on this one. Quedex aka Mindroll is a puzzle game consisting of 10 different levels that can be played in any order, in which you control a silver ball with which you need to locate an exit square in each of the levels. It is easier said than done however as each of the levels apart from the first introductory one is a maze and a challenge of its own, requiring you to use teleports, conveyor belts, jump and locate keys needed to open areas that are initially inaccessible. All that in a very limited time that often feels like most challenging factor itself, let alone all the obstacles and puzzles. Quedex is fun even if a bit demanding and treat to those who enjoy environmental puzzle games. Graphics while having a very simple subject to portray are pretty nice and sounds are good too. Music is only ever present in two stages, which is a no choice, but it is what it is I suppose. Personally I like Quedex, whether you will is up to you. There are two versions of Rampage on C64, this European released in 1987 and US one released two years later. Both are based on an arcade game of the same title, but which is better is up to you, as they both have their own strengths and weaknesses. The protagonists of the game are George, Lizzie and Ralph, so a giant gorilla, lizard and werewolf respectively, and they have to destroy the buildings in different cities by damaging them to the point that they would collapse. You do so by smashing sidewalls on all floors from both sides, and when they are all damaged, the building is destroyed. It's not all rainbow and roses however, and the cities are being actively defended by both police and military. They send hundreds upon hundreds of units against you in form of tanks, copters and shooters, and while they're all mostly harmless on their own, the sheer amount makes a difference and they can be an issue if left unattended. While Rampage is quite fun, even if that repeatable when played alone, it gets much better with a friend, and that's how it should be experienced. Period. Rapid Fire is an arcade side-scrolling shooter, and it's all about fast action and pure fun. There's some kind of a backstory of you being an undercover cop who must destroy a warehouse filled with armed bank robbers, but if I'm to be honest the plot is irrelevant, you won't think about it at all, it will not stop you in your tracks and you'll keep on doing what you do best, so causing mayhem and destruction in all levels. Enemies come from both sides at ground and roof level and there's seemingly unlimited numbers of them, as if the building itself was spawning them into existence from another dimension. This is, however, also entirely unimportant because you're not there to ponder about their origin, but conversely, to put an end to their existence. While you do that though, keep an eye on your machine gun, as if it's in constant use it may overheat and require a moment to cool down. Moment that may be the difference between your life and death. Neither graphics nor sounds are of very high quality, but same as with the plot, they are drowned quickly in a sea of frantic action and you don't really get to wonder about them too much, spewing thousands of bullets all around. Rapid Fire is not the best run and gun on C64, but it's definitely one of the better fun because it's simple games and looks eerily similar to little known arcade game called Special Forces. It's not the same, but similarities are uncanny. Rebounder is a sequel to Aerial Bounder and equally is good even if a bit different game. It's a true sequel, meaning that it kept what worked from original's formula and expanded and changed bits and pieces here and there to provide novelty and variety without changing the mechanics too much. The aim of the game is to collect 16 smart bombs to use them against the evil overall. Same as in original, you'll face many of his minions along the way but can shoot them with your gun and at the end of each level face a stronger enemy in the form of a sentinel. 
there's quite a few weapons to pick up, which is not something you'd expect from a bouncing ball game, and they shoot different projectiles. There are also 9 different distinctive enemies, each with their own capabilities and numerous environmental obstacles to contend with. Same as in Bounder, Rebounder did not forget about slabs, and they can offer you extra points, larger bounds, and mysterious unknown bonuses, both good and bad. This time, however, you can pick, if you'd like, the playfield to scroll horizontally or vertically, which, while unnecessary, is a nice quality of life addition. Graphics and sound-wise, Rebounder looks great, same as its predecessor did, and gameplay is as addicting too. So, if you like arcade games with some puzzle elements that are just that little bit different than anything else, Rebounder is a game for you. Vermeer is my most favorite business management and trading game of 1980s. It came out on C64, Amstrad CPC, Atari ST, Amiga and DOS, and it is equally brilliant and near identically playing on all of the machines. In short, you left with a bit of cash and a target of recovering stolen arts by Vico Vermeer, and since paintings are expensive, so you'll have to multiply your money. So you'll be building plantations, investing in stocks and trading various pieces of art. And quite honestly, the game is better if you ignore the fact that you're supposed to do something to end it. It's best played as an open-ended business simulation. And the fact that up to 4 players can compete simultaneously makes it even better. If you'd like to know more, I have a separate video review on it on my channel, and I'll link it in the top right and in the description below. It's Amiga's version review, but they're all virtually the same. Oh, and the game is in German only. I don't speak or read German, but I've played it so many times that I understand everything in it. And believe me, it's so good that it's worth just giving it that little time to get used to, to the controls being in it, even if you don't speak the language. A true arcade classic that has seen ports to most if not all 8 and 16-bit systems and is probably overshadowed in this number only by Skyrim, that to my knowledge can run on anything from calculators through fridges to out-of-date tomato soup cans alike. In fact, if anything runs on power or electricity, or imagination for that matter, chances are it can also run a port of Skyrim in some form or fashion, regardless if it even should. C64's Bubble Bobble is an amazing conversion true to the arcade running beautifully even on this very basic system. It may not shock with colorful graphics, it has no parallax scrolling whatsoever, multiple gameplay planes or even high quality sound, but that tune, that tune man, that main tune is so darn good that regardless how much you try, you'll have tough time forgetting it. It will haunt you in your sleep and awake, forever. And you will not hear it in this video because of copyright strikes. What's most important though is that C64's conversion kept the addictive gameplay of the original and nothing was lost in translation. If you love the arcade game, you'll love it on Commodore's machine. I have no doubt about that. Maniac Mansion is the first ever modern point-and-click adventure game released by LucasArts and first to use Scum Engine. Scum was acronym for Script Creation Utility for Maniac Mansion, but as history has proven, it was used in different iterations for basically all following adventure titles by LucasArts and sparked general movement in the industry of dropping old text-based parsers in favor of more user-friendly and intuitive point-and-click system. System that the whole genre got its name from. The Maniac Mansion is a game designed by Ron Gilbert and Gary Winnick, who wanted to tell a comedic story that would be heavily based on B-horror movies. The game follows Dave Miller, who with a couple of friends sets on saving his girlfriend Sandy, who was kidnapped and held locked by a mad scientist Dr. Fred. Other than the omnipresent humor and click interface, main notable novelty of the game was its design. When starting the game, player is asked to pick two out of the six available characters that will join Dave in saving Sandy. Each of them has a completely unique set of skills and personality, and any combination can be used to complete the game. But since some puzzles can only be solved by certain characters, different sets of puzzles are required on each playthrough, when different characters are chosen. Maniac Mansion is one of the most important games in history and should be experienced by any true gamer at least once. Renegade is widely considered to be responsible for the creation of the whole side-scrolling beat-em-up genre. Is it the case? It's hard to tell, but there's no doubt about it being one of the very first games implementing the walking and punching formula. You're an unknown vigilante, a renegade, beating up any and all enemies you come across. In the game at least, cause in reality you may be an astronaut as well as kindergarten teacher. I have no way of knowing that. Unless you tell me in the comments below that is. When you read the stage out of the set number of bodies, a boss enemy shows up to deal with you himself. The fighting mechanics are rather simple in Renegade with couple of punches and kicks only and no flashy or screen clearing special moves. The enemy AI in later stages is actually pretty decent and more often than not they will try to surround you to overwhelm you. There's up to three of them on screen at once, so if not taken care of, they can actually do that. At the time, Renegade was groundbreaking title and a game everyone wanted to be able to play at home. Today, given how many a lot better games in the genre there are, it's a curiosity at best, but one worth experiencing at least once. 
Remember Refs we spoke about few C64 videos ago? Well, Refs Plus is the same game, but it's ultimate, more complete final version. It is also probably the most realistic Formula 3 simulation on C64 and one of the best simulators on the system overall. As compared to the first game, it features four additional real-life tracks of Alton Park, Snetterton, Donington Park and Nürburgring. The last one I've butchered beyond belief, I've no doubt about that. There's full joystick compatibility added and built-in computer-aided control assist. I'm not gonna say much more about it, I've already said my piece in an older video, all you should know is that it's the same game as original was, but better and still worth playing. Roadrunner on Commodore 64 is near ideal portrayal of the cartoon's classic shenanigans of Roadrunner and Wiley E. Coyote as seen on TV. It's an arcade game where you play as the titular character and have to escape the ever-hungry Wiley E. Coyote. Your goal is simple, to reach the very end of the stage and it is located in the far left of the four side-scrolling levels. You can only run on the road and nothing else. So all obstacles, mines, tracks or narrowing of the road have to be avoided. You are, after all, a road runner, not just a runner. Fortunately, most of these can be jumped over. As you speed along, you also collect seeds, because you have to keep your seed meter filled. If it ever runs out, the coyote will not go to sleep hungry that night. And since we're on a subject, he too is after you. And while at first he's not even a nuisance running much slower, soon enough he starts utilizing TV famous Acme items. So rocket parts, brawler skate, pogo stick and helicopter backpack to name a few. As the time goes by, he will use more and more ingenious items to get to you. Roadrunner is quite fun, and as TV slash movies conversions to games in the 80s go, it's pretty good. Graphically, it's very eye-pleasing too. Sounds and music are another case, but not bad enough to detract from playing. If you like the cartoon or enjoy arcade games in general, this one's worth checking out. Saboteur 2 is a mixed bag. On one hand, some things have improved as compared to the original, on the other, some things didn't change or are even noticeably worse. Combat in general is more fluid and fun, which is always important in a game with a ninja protagonist. And I understand that he may not be ninja per se, but that's what I always pictured him as. Oh, excuse me, her. Because Saboteur is actually a woman, and a sister of late protagonist of the first outing. The game world is bigger too, spanning crazy sounding 700 screams, but for some reason it doesn't feel as rich and sorta seem to be emptier than before. An omission of turrets is just criminal and not worth any additional comments than that. Fortunately, the game still plays as good as original did and is as fun to explore and combat different enemies. Back in the day, I didn't know the game's story nor I really cared about it. For me, it was a cool game about a ninja I got to get lost in, never really completing it. Also, first time I played it on my cousin's Timex and not my C64 and I was instantly stunned how great it was. And then disappointed at home that the graphics and sounds on C64 were not improved whatsoever. Saracen is an action puzzle game that rewards methodical slower approach and smart planning rather than fast reactions. The game consists of 100 levels, each being a puzzle to solve, and your objective in each is to reach the titular Saracen chief and detonate bomb next to him, effectively blasting him out of existence. He doesn't move and stays in his position stationary like a statue, so it's up to you to get to him. Roaming guards, traps and cannonballs is what's between the two of you, so you have to puzzle your way to him using your four directional shooting bow and arrows to rid of the guards and destroy walls. You can only carry one item at a time, key, arrow or a bomb, so careful planning and strategy is the best way to find each puzzle's solution, especially that there's only one per puzzle. While the graphics of Saracen are beyond bad for 1987, the gameplay loop is actually really fun and rewarding. So if you enjoy games that require you to stretch your brain muscle a bit, it's a good one. Shoot'em Up Construction Kit, in short SEUCK, is not a game, but it still belongs here. It's a set of very simple utilities allowing player to draw, animate and move the sprites, create backgrounds, sound effects and music, and most importantly, set up the game rules to create top-down shoot'em ups. I mean, there was no reason to prolong it anymore, the title said it all, but here you go, I explained the obvious. And what we're watching in the background are the games made with it. It's a brilliantly simple and usable set of tools that in the right hands could be responsible for the next big hit on C64, regardless of how small the market for this is currently. And while it was not always the case, we have now thousands of games made with it available online. Some better, some worse, all worth considering given how they were made. SEUCK comes with four built-in games demonstrating basic use of the toolkit. If you ever wanted to make your own C64 game, there's really no easier way. 
Sidewalk is unusual. It's a mixture of genres that's unlike anything else. It's also a game that has been clearly ported from ZX Spectrum as it only features monochromatic graphics. Which is a waste on C64, but I suppose we've grown used to it by now, right? In Sidewalk you play as a young lad who promised to take his girlfriend to a rock concert, but at 3pm he realized that his bike was disassembled and stolen. So you must find all the parts of it before 7.30pm to be able to make it, as otherwise she will go with someone else. Now, all the gameplay mechanics aside, I have nothing good to say about her. If she's ready to leave you just because you lost your bike, it's not love. You're her servant boy to at best. One way or another, the time is working against you, so you traverse the streets of the city, meeting people and interrogating them about your bike, and if you decide that they may have a piece or take the offense to the questioning, the game turns into beat em up with punches, kicks and headbutts at your disposal to lay waste to the petty thieves. Your health is represented by a beer bottle and while it empties your death. I don't know how much of an alcohol fiend you are, but clearly you're not a newbie, if lowering blood alcohol level can actually kill you. You can refill your energy by going into a bar for a drink. Ok, I think I mistook things for what they were initially. It seems it's not your girlfriend who's an asshole, it's been you all this time. You drink all day long, drive or rather ride the bike while under the influence and also beat up people, whether they know something about your bike or not. You know what, I've praised you so many times for saving the world or universe, but you're no good. You and I, our friendship is done, until you sort yourself out once and for all. I'm disappointed. I really am, but not in you, in myself, for blindly believing in your greatness while ignoring your obvious issues. Skate or Die is an arcade skateboarding game. It features five different events. First is a half pipe freestyle in which you have 10 attempts to score as many points as possible performing various tricks. In second, high jump, you're still in the half pipe but have to, and I'm sure you figured it out already, jump as high as possible. The next one's downhill, that's played from the top down view, and your aim is to complete the course in under 90 seconds. Downhill jam, however, pits you on the same track against CPU or a second player, but allows you to use attack moves to knock your opponent over. And lastly, there's pool joust, which is is kind of a beat em up using a stick in a skateboard pit. Skate or Die is probably the best game of its genre for the time it released in, and definitely a title worth playing. Skyfox 2 The Cygnus Conflict is more of a Wing Commander game without the background storyline than a follow up to the first Skyfox. It features 10 different missions and 4 difficulty levels, and as realistic simulation as it's possible on an 8 bit system. Let the fact that there's 28 keys you need to memorize, other than just the joystick controls to fully appreciate the game, be the testament to that. Skyfox 2 offers quite a diverse weapon system too, so if you're into space combat simulations played out of the cockpit, there's a lot to like here. Graphics and sounds are pretty good too, definitely adding to the immersion. And while Skyfox gameplay loop may not be for everyone, those who do like those kinds of games will really appreciate it. Slap Fight aka Alcon is a vertically scrolling shoot em up taking place over planet Aurak. Evil aliens have occupied it and once again you're picked for the task of freeing it from their clutches. I know I gave you a hard time before about your drinking, but you know I've done it because I care, right? So, don't take it personally please, just put the drink down and save the innocent for Christ's sake, they have no one else. Oh, you're about to do that anyway? Sorry. Slab Fight features a ship upgrade system based on stars picked up during gameplay. The more you collect, the more upgrades you'll have access to. They're displayed at the bottom of the screen and they are speed, shot, side shot, wings upgrade, bomb shot, laser shot, homing missiles and shield upgrade. All of these offer different bonuses, weapon strength or capabilities and all are useful in one way or another. But if I could recommend something, laser shot was always something that worked fine for me. Slap Fight doesn't feature separate levels, just a continuous long single gameplay loop with bosses popping up every now and then. If you manage to complete the game without dying, it carries on from beginning at higher difficulty level. The graphics are pretty nice, sound design is good too, neither are worth talking about more, but they do their job well. What's worth pointing out though is the gameplay, which is just great. Believe me or not, it's your choice, but Slap Fight is easily one of the best vertical shooters on C64. It seems that the late 80s were a time of innovation when it comes to gameplay mechanics. Many new games released and they all seem to be introducing something new and exciting, new ways to play the games or new ideas behind how they work. Solomon's Key is one of those titles. It's a puzzle platformer in which in each level your goal is to retrieve the key that is used to unlock the exit. All levels are timed and feature enemies that are out to get you. Some of them you can kill by removing the block that they stand on, others need to be avoided as they're indestructible. The levels are not always apparently completable at first glance as they need to be rearranged. You will then magic wand that can be used to remove blocks and create new ones. So you will have to cut passages through walls and spawn platforms to walk on. There are a lot of hidden bonuses in the game and even some useful spells that can be used against enemies. I can't recommend it enough, Solomon's Key is a great title, worth playing even today. 
Spore is a top-down arcade shooter in which you fight your way through a hazardous spore infestation that escaped the scientific laboratory. Not unlike what happened a couple of years ago in real life and then assumed the name starting with C and ending with 19. The only way to stop the spore's growth is to eradicate it with an antidote. To do so however you will have to travel to the lab to pick the canisters of it and then shoot your way through numerous spores to destroy the generators with said antidote. Oh and the lab doesn't look like one, just so you know. As you go about your dangerous but as per usual for your heroic mission you may find helpful items like flasks that refill your energy or pills that scare off spores for a short time. Don't know if the video gives the game justice but it's actually really fun and if you complete it you can even double in some designing yourself as the level editor is included in the package too. Other than the presentation everything is great about spores so give it a chance. The story of Star Pose is weird to say the least but let's try to understand it together. So, apparently griffins exist. And not only they do, but also their space griffins. Tasty space griffins to be precise. Yes, tasty, because their delicacy unreachable for most and a quite exquisite in flavor. Since we've established the baseline, let's see what's next. Oh yeah, so apparently a group of mercenaries has been secretly breeding them on the moon of a distant planet, with a sneaky plan of destabilizing the market and somehow seizing power because of that. I have no idea how this could be related cause it just doesn't compute under my roof regardless how hard I think about it. But whatever, I might just not be smart enough. So this is where you jump in, this time in form of a Captain Rover Postron, a bipedal and from what I can see having opposing thumbs dog. I know, crazy. I mean who would have named their dog Rover Postron? The rest I can believe, evolution blah blah blah, thumbs blah blah blah, but Rover Postron? That's unheard of. Anyway, what you have to do to succeed is find, chase and kill 20 of those tasty space griffins on and below the surface of the moon. The game is viewed from a side perspective and both ways scrolling. Other than capturing griffins, you'll also be picking up randomly scattered useful items like anti-gravity pads, rockets, rocket launchers, explosives, mining lamp, ammunition and food to replenish your health. Mining lamp is used underground so make sure to grab it when you get a chance. Star Pose is an odd but fun game, if you like those, try it out. Theoretically Star Soldier is a top-down horizontally scrolling run and gun shooter. Theoretically because in reality it's a walking shooter at best. Your character is so slow moving in fact that it seems as if he was tiptoeing really. But don't let my dissing discourage you from playing cause Star Soldier is not a bad game at all. It is divided into two very distinctive sections. In first you arm yourself for the mission, then scan star systems for planets and when you find one you gather information about it checking if there are any job listings there. Second part of the game are the missions on the planet surfaces themselves, where you tiptoe from right to left disposing of any and all enemies that you encounter. Fortunately Star Soldier does not feature one shot kill mechanic and you have a health bar, so any stray bullet or an enemy that you happen to touch only reduces it rather than impede your entire level progress after a single hit. The game is controlled with a joystick but you can also launch missiles or throw grenades with a spacebar if you only happen to carry them. Some enemies drop weapons and money when killed and I don't have to tell you what to do with those. Or do I? Nah, you're good, you're good, I hope. When you get to the end of the level in far left it's completed and you can scan for planets to carry on. Rinse and repeat. I honestly don't know if there's any story to Star Soldier and it may very well be just that scanning and shooting loop. But if you enjoy shooters, that's not bad now is it? Not unlike the more well known Star Fox, the one on Nintendo 64, Commodore's earlier Star Fox is also a space shooter. In this Star Fox however you're not really a fox, but you're a star, as usual, cause again you're the only one who can save the universe. I know I keep talking about it, but sheer number of times you've saved us all had to earn you at least a Mr. Potato Head statue made into your likeness, right? Let me know, I'm genuinely curious. Anyway you play as Hawkins, a space fighter pilot and you have to protect your star system against evil aliens' invasion. The game is viewed from inside the cockpit and all graphics are full 3D wireframe vectors, which may not seem like much, but it's pretty much the only real 3D on those older systems that could run at semi-reasonable pace. There's 8 missions that you have to complete in Star Fox and they range in objectives too. You travel the space between amusing wormholes and have 3 weapons to choose from, all upgradable. Oh, and the fuel is finite, so you'll need to locate and use refueling ships too. While this older Star Fox may not be as impressive graphically or gameplay wise as the one released years later was, in some ways it is much more advanced than the newer one. Stormbringer is Mastertronic's fourth and final adventure featuring the Magic Knight as protagonist of the Finder's Keepers, Spellbound and Night Time that we've spoke about already in previous videos. This time our hero has to find and defeat the titular Stormbringer, his own evil off-white alter ego, and eventually when it's done merge with him to become a full character again. 
Same as in previous games, you'll be collecting items and using them for puzzling purposes and conversing with NPC characters and listing them to help you. Playing earlier games to understand Stormbringer is not necessary, but it's definitely something that would help you not only understand the plot, but also our little guy's motivations. Not unlike in previous titles, the interactions with the game world and characters is done via a series of pop-up menus, which may not be the most sophisticated thing ever, but are still much more preferable method of control than the text parsers. Graphics didn't change much from previous games and are still very ZX Spectrum-like in their feel, and sounds and music are a ok But if you've played earlier games and want to know how the overarching story will end, or just like adventure titles in general, this one's definitely worth your time. Sid Meier's Pirates, my most favorite game on C64 and arguably the best on the system. Yep, well, I could end it here really, and I'm sure most would know everything I would like to or could say about it. But most is not all. So, if I was to choose one person that changed the whole world of gaming by designing constantly more ingenious titles and plethoral genres while creating some of those genres in the process, it would have to be Sid Meier. The man is a genius. I mean, if you look up genius in Wikipedia, his picture will show up. But do me a favor and don't fact check that. You trust me after all, right? Anyway, Pirates is a game of many things. It's an action adventure with role-playing elements, pirate fleet management overtones and all that sprinkled with some good old strategy bits. It's a true gem. And if I was to simply summarize it in short, I'd say it's a game where you live your best pirate life. It gets you so involved in that elusive lifestyle that you quickly forget of real world and your daily troubles, just going on your merry way swashbuckling, hunting treasures, defeating forts, sinking fleets worth of ships and capturing cities. All in pursuit of the loot aka the big whoop, and your long lost family. Not necessarily in that order. That said, I never played Pirates to completion. I never aimed to end it. For me, it was always a game in which I could get lost for days, if not weeks, living among the buccaneer scum in the Caribbean. Sometimes I'd spend weeks trading, looking to peacefully become the richest man on the seas. Sometimes I'd pirate hunt for one of the nations, searching for and disposing of the one-eyed bearded, parrot-loving, grog-drinking privateers. But more often than not, I'd play as a titular pirate, aiming to be the scourge of the seas whose name would be spoken with fear and respect alike. If all that sounds interesting to you at all, check my full review of Pirates on this very channel. It's based on Amiga version, but believe it or not, C64 and Amiga's versions of the game short of graphics and sounds are identical. When Test Drive came out on C64, it shook the world. Literally. I remember feeling the ground trembling, running to my windows and seeing nothing that might have caused it. And no later than a week or two after, I went to my friend's place and he had Test Drive. I instantly knew that this was the reason. Somehow universe connected these two occurrences. The quake was a sign. On the other hand, I might have imagined it all, and there was no earthquakes anywhere around back then, especially that I lived nowhere near tectonic plates. Still, Test Drive did shook the world as it was first, for the lack of a better word, semi-realistic driving simulation, on C64 and any other platform it came out on. Mind you that I said driving and not racing. It featured 3D feeling environments and close to life road traffic. It didn't run the best, but with the graphics it offered, at the time feeling photorealistic on a lowly 8-bit machine, it was understandable. Very detail heavy specifications for available cars and impressively rendered side views of these in the menu sparked my childhood imagination and made me feel as if I could really drive one of these beasts. I couldn't, cause as soon as I started driving I quickly realized that the constantly breaking windscreen is not the experience I was looking for. Obviously I'm exaggerating a little bit, but this in reality was neither simulation nor arcade racer. Something in between that was just ok at best, but was important nonetheless, because without it we wouldn't get Test Drive 2 and basically most other modern racing simulations. Tiger Mission is a vertically scrolling shoot em up in which you control a battle helicopter that travels through 5 not overly long levels to destroy the enemy base at the end, all the while avoiding being destroyed yourself and disposing of hundreds if not thousands of enemy units. Interestingly enough, they are all grounded so you won't be facing any air opposition. Your cannon is more than enough to dispose of them but if the situation ever gets too hot for your liking, you can use one of your few smart bombs to clear the screen. As you progress through the not overly so difficult stages you'll be able to pick up power-ups, and those can be missiles, additional smart bombs or a speed up. Only one of your shots can be on the screen at once so make sure to aim rather than bullet hell your way through the game. The difficulty is very fair, slowly growing rather than ramping up unexpectedly, though there is a slight noticeable bump from the third stage. Tiger Mission may not be the best shoot em up on C64, but it's a really fun game with a very steady and not overwhelming progression. The Train Escape to Normandy is an action-adventure game with simulation elements, loosely based on the plot of The Train, a movie starring Burt Lancaster. You're a train hijacker who tried to smuggle a collection of paintings from Paris to a light-controlled Normandy by stolen train so that the works of art could be saved and would not end up in German hands. And you're in control of virtually everything, from setting the throttle to correct speed, 
ensuring that there's enough coal in the furnace to releasing the steam when necessary. You'll also plan your route using strategic map and rate railway stations to get to the track switches. The train is a really unusual game, so if you're in the mood for something that's unlike anything else, it's definitely a title not to sleep on. Whizball is widely considered as one of, if not the best, arcade shooter on C64. And no wonder, as it was conceived by John Hare and Chris Yates, co-founders of later brilliant Sensible Software. It's a side-scrolling shooter inspired by Gradius with an additional collection mechanic, where you need to collect a certain number of colorful blobs in each level, red, green and blue, to restore the color to the whiz world and progress to the next stage. All because each of 8 available levels starts monochromatic and you're the only one that can restore the pigment to it. As you defeat the omnipresent enemies, you collect tokens that they drop and these can be used to buy upgrades. They can be a stronger shot, better controls or a flying companion catalyte, to name a few. Yes, as in cat satellite. And it's crucial to get that last one as soon as possible, as it's the only way for you to actually collect paint blobs to restore the color to the land. Whizball sounds like an oddball of a game when explained. In reality, it needs to be played to be fully appreciated. So, do it. Wonder Boy is a conversion of an arcade platforming classic, and it's an amazing one, I must add. It truly is a wonder. Boy oh boy what a great game Wonder Boy is. I wonder, if more conversions from arcades were as wonderful as this one is, would we see more years of Commodore's reign? Or would we eventually start boycotting games that were conversions and not original titles? After all, C64 was technological wonder and any boy and girl at the time could not hope for a better system to have. And those that did have it, did not wonder if any were better. Boy, what a time it was to live. A wonderful time, one might say. Ok, that's more than enough already. A cringe is spilling from your speakers by now, I presume. For all intents and purposes, Wonder Boy is one-to-one -one port from arcades. It features all stages present in the original, all enemies, all pickups and upgrades, and gameplay mechanics of which there are many. Graphics and sounds are nearly identical too, so while I cringed from here to the moon in the beginning, I was not that far off. Wonder Boy indeed was a show off of C64's capabilities. Starwise, you're a young fellow named Tom Tom who has to save his girlfriend Tanya that was kidnapped by an evil woodland king. So you'll platform your way through 10 levels, 4 stages each, until you save your love. On the way you'll collect fruit to refill your health, defeat thousands of over the top cute monsters and collect and use many power-ups, usually either hidden in dinosaur eggs or floating in the air, defying gravity. This can be hatches, so a better weapon, skateboards allowing you to move faster and jump higher, guardian angels that grant temporary invulnerability and more. There's a boss every 4 stages that has to be put down for you to carry on. Overall, if you like the arcade game or enjoy fast action platformers, you'll love Wonder Boy. Defender of the Crown is Cinemaware's masterpiece. And what a game it is. It is clear that Cinemaware knew, and most importantly, they'd actually squeeze everything they possibly could out of C64. While Amiga's version was definitely the most beautiful outing out of millions of versions that Cinemaware released on the systems of the time, Commodore's was the best and full-fledged experience. Amiga's had some features missing, but that's a subject for an entirely different video. Defender of the Crown is a mixture of genres, where at parts you would lead your chosen and start Saxon rule to victory, to conquer England, just to then switch to more arcade-like jousting tournaments, castle raids or even slower-paced catapulting of enemy walls. So you'll be building armies and attacking neighboring territories as much as managing your kingdom, running tournaments for influence and riches and overall getting lost in this medieval fantasy. Whatever you want to say about Cinemaware, they could and they did easily have their audiences enchanted in cinematic worlds they created. Mixing various gameplay styles with presentation fidelity, more often than not, they served a juicy pie of entertainment that hardly anyone could walk by unimpressed. Don't let the superlatives fool you though, neither of Defender of the Crown's building blocks was perfect. But they were all good enough and stitched together so well they formed incredible experience for players, with presentation that was unbeatable for quite some time. Deflector is a terrible, awful, disgusting game. Note that down. Not because it's a bad one, but because it's so addicting. And you should not give it a go. Unless you have hours to spare, that is. I mean it. Well, if you are allergic to puzzlers, then it will most likely bore you to death. But if you do enjoy an occasional brain stretch, it's a good one. The aim of the game, or in short game, spelled G-A-I-M, I have to patent that one because I like it. Anyway, the game is simple. Direct the light beam from its source using series of mirrors to destroy all the mines in each of the 60 levels to progress to the next one. Each mirror can be set at 16 different angles and you have to be extra careful not to aim the beam at one of the many dangerous objects for too long, as they will overheat and explode, costing you your life. And since there's no saves, you always start from the very beginning. As you progress, the game will introduce various new obstacles like teleports or random angle changers and eventually even droids that walk around the stages moving the mirror's directions. 
Deflector is not a game for everyone, but those that enjoy puzzlers, especially the real-time puzzlers, will definitely want to try it out. Deja Vu A Nightmare Comes True is an innovative point-and-click adventure game. It works of an engine that resembles window-based interface of operating systems of yesteryear and uses verbs to control the interactions. Other than that, it's full drag and drop, meaning any item pickups can be done via mouse by dragging them into inventory. Another quite novel concept of Deja Vu was ability to drop items anywhere in the game. And if you only remember where you left them, you could always come back at any moment to pick them back up. But it's not what made the game popular. Deja Vu was a heavy noir story. You're an ex-boxer turned private investigator, which in itself sounds like a screenplay for a juicy B-movie, and you wake up in a random bar's bathroom with an unexpected amnesia. Not that there are expected ones. And also a mysterious unknown dead body in front of you, clearly killed using your own gun. From this point, you're after both your lost memories and a true killer to clear your name. All that while avoiding the mob and law enforcements, as they are both out to get you. What's important though is that the game doesn't use any supernatural reasons for whatever is happening, meaning you can actually use logic and deduction to solve all the puzzles that it offers. So, 1987's done. I don't know about you, but I'm convinced that it was the best year for C64's gaming. I mean, I predict that 1988 will be a good one too, but it's gonna have a huge shoes to fill in, and I doubt that it can pull it off. I mean, so many of the all-time classics released in 1987, it's unlikely that any year even came close. That, however, is a subject for another time. Please make sure to subscribe not to miss the release of the next video. 70% of you are not subscribed, so you can never be sure if YouTube decides to send the video your way when it's released. Even better, if you ring the ding that bell down there, new videos will not only land in your subs box, but you'll also get a short and friendly notification when they're out. So think about it. If you'd like to support the channel grow, I'd appreciate both Patreon and YouTube memberships. All the help I get allows me to release better content and I currently slowly work towards replacing my editing PC. Given current hardware prices, it'll take a while, but that's a target I aim for. Members get access to my new videos a day early and are always in the loop on what I plan to release, change, introduce and so on. But if you can't or don't want to do that, likes and subscribes are great too. Most of all, however, I would like to thank all the YouTube Let's Play and Playthrough creators, from whose videos short bits were taken for this one as a video background to my commentary. You'll find all their names linking to their channels in the description below. They're amazing and thanks to their efforts, retro community can prevail for years longer and in better form than it could have otherwise. So thank you. For me though, this is all, so have a good one and I'll see you next time. Peace.